institution at large on the creation and perpetuation of different trends of political thought and action. On October 28, 2018, Brazil elected its new president, Jair Messias Bolsonaro, a self-proclaimed far-right politician from the Social Liberal Party, won the polls with 55% of the ballot votes against Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. Internationally famous for his inflammatory declarations uh, on a series of topics, ranging from instances of racism, sexism, and homophobia, to several confessions of a lack of understanding of federal economy, Mr. Bolsonaro has garnered a substantial amount of supporters in a span of two years preceding this year's elections, despite the fact that he has been a member of the lower level of Congress for the past 28 years. Bolsonaro's meteoric rise owes much to the crisis experienced by the Workers' Party in the last few years, with several of its top tier members being accused of corruption and administrative crimes through the massive car wash operation. A little short of seven weeks away from the beginning of Bolsonaro's mandate, controversy surrounds the plans for his administration, with proposal for ministerial cuts and head nominations sparking a range of reactions from different segments of the population. Among them, those worried about environmental damage, the perpetration of corruption, the role of agents of the military in the upcoming term, in light of this institution's alarming history in Brazilian politics. With emotions running high in the largest democracy in Latin America, it does us all well to pay attention to Professor Schwartz's advice in her latest column for the Spanish branch of the New York Times. Brazil has chosen its president, and now it has to keep on moving forward. It is the duty of civil society to remain alert and always reclaim the consolidation of its hard-fought rights. Thank you. Professor Schwartz, the floor is yours. that if you if I was aware I think a professor at Colombia today I took the wrong subway. <laughs> so I want to step the thank the Brazilian Society, the Department of Latin America and Iberian Cultures and Colombia, that's correct. And also Gabriel Franco for insisting in having me here. <laughs> it was just this week that I decided to read, to read more carefully the text Gabriel wrote for this afternoon, for this section. Please allow, I think you read it, but please allow, allow me to read it again for you. <laughs> we, will dis, we will discuss the contemporary political panorama in Brazil, the impacts of political and the national population's life patterns, political resistance, historical aspect of Brazilian presidential rule, local dynamics of oppression and inequality, and the various expectations for a new shift of power next gender. So, <laughs> if I would try to follow, uh, I would try to follow this, this text as a conversation, but I, I have to say that looks, looks like everything you wanted to ask your friends, parents, professors, and never had never the courage to ask. It's a joke, correct? <laughs> Oh, certainly, I will have no time and conditions to talk about everything. Even for a person that wrote a biography of Brazil, <laughs> that can be too much. Maybe I would be more productive if I would start proposing some subjects, like pillars of Brazil, and then we can really start our, our conversation. Go for it. As we all know, Brazil continues to be a very unequal country. Inequality was inherited by our colonial past, as you know, but has been recreated in the present day. We also know how racist Brazilians can be. The slave system and the post-emancipation period, period, as we call the moment immediately after the Golden Law in, of 1888, was and still is one of the biggest contradictions of the history of Brazil. In fact, Brazil received 4.7% of the 12 million Africans that had to leave the continent. Brazil was also, as you know, the last country to abolish the system and had enslaved all over its territory. In fact, the Golden Law was a very conservative one, in my opinion, and perpetuated a kind of racism that we call structural, a structural arm. Silence 
naturalization of violence, denial of hierarchy and inequality were and are some of the attitudes one can find in Brazil, in Brazil as a character. Despite the official depiction we like to sell for ourselves and abroad, Brazil was and still is a very violent country, a country that had enslaved more than for more than three centuries, a system based on the assumption that a person can have, can own another person, has another, uh, have, have, has another chance of being violent. As a very consistent and original historiography shows, enslaved did fought for freedom in very different ways. Organized quilombos, insurrections, individual leagues, committed suicides, killed and poisoned the arms. Secondly, during colonial and imperial and republican times, rebellions happened in different parts of the country, showing that Brazil is far from being a, a very pacific country. Brazil was also a Portuguese colony for more than three centuries, and later on an empire surrounded by republics everywhere. Understand that specificity that even nowadays are part of our agenda it's a very, a very important issue, in my opinion, again. For example, it's not a coincidence that the Republican regime started with a double mistake, or up to file, I don't know if you have a translation for up to file. That shows how, even today, titles are important for the new aristocracy and strong elites of Brazil. In 1889, the new vice president, Floriano Peixoto, sent a letter to the Minister of Justice explaining that from that moment on there were no more titles of nobility in Brazil. But he addressed the letter to Baron of Hubranco that answered, position, uh, answered with a pompous yes and signed Baron, Baron of Hubranco. We also found in patrimonialism the use of public spaces as private ones, a common attitude in Brazil since colonial times. During the 17th century, there was a very popular proverb that said in Brazil that the one that steals few is a thief. The one that steals a lot is a baron. Quem rouba pouco é ladrão. Quem rouba muito é baron. Corruption is the poison of the republic. But enter in the state as a kind of common sense since colonial times. Let me read a piece that was written by Lima Barreto in 1918, but it looks like uh, you're going to see this file. So I quote Lima Barreto. The Republic of Brazil is a regime of corruption. Nobody wants to debate. Nobody wants to stir up ideas. Nobody wants to put any real feeling into it. Everybody wants a slice of the action. The jurists want their slice. The philosophers want their slice. The doctors want their slice. The novelists want their slice. The engineers want their slice. The journalists want their slice. Brazil is one big pie. In the terms of Lima Barreto, o Brasil é uma grande comilança. Brazil sometimes can be considered a very modern country, and sometimes a very traditional one, as you get to view things in Parabólica Camará. From a raft takes an eternity, from a soul an incarnation, and from a plane a missing time. O tempo de uma saudade. What else? Brazil is a very diverse country, based by more than 200 native nations, black people, people from different parts of the African continent, European, Japanese, Chinese immigrants, and others with different customs. But let me talk about our present. I think that, that's what we want. There was a moment that we Brazilian really believed that the country would not be considered any longer as a country of the future. Agora vai, let's go, we started to say. After 30 years of democracy with a very modern and com complex constitution, 
Monica Ted talks about this. Very well established institutions, we thought. Eloisa Stalin and, and I, when, I and we, when we wrote the conclusion of a book called Brazilian Biography. At that time, I'm talking about 2000, the beginning of 2014, we, I could say that we've experienced the utopia of a new country. We put a date, Eloise and I, and finished our conclusion, writing that time was running fast. <coughs> we were also very much enchanted with the public parades as manifestações of 2013 that brought new items to our agenda. The gender question, the black and Afro-Brazilian issues, the ecological subjects that us, the, the manifestations always asked for the end of corruption and so on and so on. What we did not see, Eloisa and I, and I guess, a part of the Brazilians, was that Brazil was, even at that time, a profoundly divided country. It seemed like two avenues in the same Paulista Avenue in Sao Paulo. And that was what's happening all over the country. Two avenues in one avenue. We also did not notice a perverse process of corrosion of all political institutions. A very weak executive and a stronger judiciary power. Uh, <coughs> that's why when we finish translating the book in English and uh, our North American and English publishers had asked us to write a new conclusion, they said, it's not enough. <laughs> what happened with Doma? What happened with PT? We insisted in keeping the original one as a kind of proof of passage of time. We thought it was an important document. Also as a proof that we were, we were wrong when we wrote in 2014 that institutions were very strong in Brazil, but the Republic failed. In my opinion, both failed. Then we wrote a kind of epilogue afterwards to the, to the new edition uh, in the United States and, and in the UK. We described the impeachment process the car wash, the lava chart, the corruption, the process in Petrobras, the weakness of the institutions, but unfortunately, this new piece was born old and dated. We could not predict, as Gabriel mentioned, in the near future, this hurricane called Jair Messias Bolsonaro, the president elected in Brazil, as we all know, in, in November 2018. Machado de Assis created a beautiful character. One of them that I really like is called Conselheiro Ares. Conselheiro Ares, as the name says, he gives very good tips. But once uh, he said a very, very important sentence, uh, like kind of philosophy. He said, things were just predictable when they had already happened. <laughs> that could be a, con, a kind of consolation prize for me, for everybody. <laughs> but the truth is that we underestimate, in my opinion, the real power of the group that were around the pres presidential candidate of PSL. Various factors, various reasons can help us to explain this kind of phenomenon if you allow me to call like this. First, the two big, biggest parties that almost concentrated power during the Third Republic, as we call the Republic that started in 1988, I'm talking about PSDB and PT, could not work together, forming a kind of political front bigger than its parties or its, its politicians. It was, as you saw, impossible. B, car wash was a very important initiative that showed how corruption was part of the heart of the, heart of the state, but at the same time became part of the, the very ideological, ideological process 
that was go growing in Brazil. Happens to create these two avenues. Bolsonaro showed to be ready to galvanize all the antipathism sentiment that grew bigger and bigger in Brazil. I had no idea about the sentiment. It was very strange. He thought of being a president in 2014, Bolsonaro. He gave up and joined a kind of rental party. You know that PSL is a kind of rental party. No? And as we all know, he succeeded. He also married Michelle, a faithful evangelical wife. And Bolsonaro went to Jerusalem to be baptized as Putkin, Putkin that entered in the cold water. And Bolsonaro, we didn't know it, but he conquered a huge block of evangelical voters. Bolsonaro also, also knew and know how to manipulate the recession, the <coughs> financial crisis, and how to create a scapegoat, Borges Piapari, uh, in PT, mainly in PT, but also in the press, and also in the uh, talking about intellectuals. The future president of Brazil used Trump's example as a kind of mirror. He used an abuse of Facebook, created a profusion of fake news, and asked the people to do not trust in the press, just in him. Very similar, no? <laughs> Nevertheless, different from Trump, from Trump, he has no party to control him, and I think that the republics are Republicans are not controlling Trump. Do not have Bolsonaro, do not have a, a country with strong institutions. And Brazil has not states with autonomy. Bolsonaro will, will be, as you know, the president of Brazil having power to own ter our territory. Gee, I'm not saying that all Bolsonaro's followers are equal or even all the people that vo voted for Haddad were the same. As we work a lot in the Vida Vote, how do I have to translate this? We had that mission that every day we had to con convince at least two persons. It was like very difficult in some moments. Even when you, like, sometimes you have Bolsonaro in your family, then you could, you know, they said, I, my brother, for example, he said, okay, you convinced me. And then I, 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 I knew that he, he, he said he was new, but I'm not very sure about it. So that's the thing, that we were all surrounded by Bolsonaro. They were not foreigners. They were not, they were not strangers. They were among us. I don't know your sensation here, but being there, I asked uh, Princeton that I couldn't go to the university because I had to stay there. It was really, really a profound sentiment, a profound feeling. So what, was, what is happening in, our, in my country that I could not see? So as a political, as a social science, maybe I'm a disaster. <laughs> 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 I feel completely in the waters. <laughs> in Bolsonaro's case, that, that, was re, that, was, that was really a strong and an emotional vote against PT. And the growing of a white wing, white right wing movement, movement that was silent until the impeachment process, as you, you all know. After this, and after the crisis and the strong recession, recession that Dilma's government led, a sort of a very radical right wing starts to show up without any guilty or pain. On the contrary, a good example is the project Escola Sem Partido, School Without Party, that urged for the censor of professors at, at the end of the gender studies. I know that authoritarian discourses in politics, it's not just like a Brazilian problem. A Brazilian question. All around the world, we are facing and learning to, to know with this very authoritarian wave. No? With this very authoritarian, how can I say it? It's a wave. No? In Russia, Poland, Netherlands, Hungary, Germany, United States, we have no, now governments and very right wing parties, as Gabriel mentioned. 
It seems that the pot is open now, and it's not any longer a problem to declare himself or herself again minor against minorities, even civil rights, women, black people, native people, all of them. In fact, in my opinion, we are facing a new challenge and, and a new moment also. Uh, in our understanding of democracy, we have now, in my opinion, a new understanding of democracy. As we could mix authoritarian speeches with democracy, using the fringe of the various constitutions. That's what happened. It's happening now in Brazil, but it's happening now in the United States. When Bolsonaro won the second round, in the beginning of November, no, in the, in the beginning of November, we gave, he gave two different speeches. I don't know if you could see both of them. One, the first one, was for the internet, address, addressed directly to his more loyal followers that call him with words and expressions like myth, supreme leader, uh, that's not a fake news. I, I, I had to go to Palista Avenue, the end that the exhibition called Afro-Atlantic History was, was the last day. So I felt myself obliged to go. And when I, I tried to go very early in the morning, but when I went out, I saw the Bolsonaro's parade. I, so seeing that kind of t-shirts with this kind of word and expressions, and also I saw a car uh, when, where it's, uh, it was written white supremacism. It was like a, okay, we lost, no? I know we lost, but what can we do now? But let me talk about the, the two speeches. One for the, his most loyal followers and Facebook, and another one, an official one. During the first, During the, the first one, he spoke very free, in a very free way, without reading, talking against his main enemies, press, left intellectuals, and all of us. On the other one, he started with a kind of a, a prayer, I think you saw. Even if Brazil is a secular country, just after this, kind of religious ceremony, he put his glasses like this, started reading a speech, thanked God that elected him, and then talked to the nation. He used three words, mostly, freedom, constitution, and democracy. As one can see, he, like the two faces of Janus, he showed two different future presidents, the one that it's vengeful, the other one that wants to make peace. Let us wait and see which one will be prevail the prevail prevailing one. Means that during the following days, he continued creating fake news, supporting the movement Escola Sem Partido, and his, his followers eventually talked in. Uh, to uh, eliminate, that was the word, the books that define the coup of 64 as a coup d'etat. He also talked against preserving Amazon, against keeping terra de quimonos, even if those are rights inscribed in our constitution of 88. Again, and maintaining a kind of shows to be a uh, what, what, it's a kind of style, a political style. But Bolsonaro spoke first to the internet and second to the press. Eventually, he selected the press. Record TV was there. Folha de São Paulo was not allowed to take part of the show. At this particular moment, he's trying to build his new ministry that are taking the example of the names we already know his own images. White men, middle ages, middle class, sanitary, self-evangelical. It's too soon to say in public. 
what's going to happen in the next four years. Historians are, in fact, not very good in the history of if. <laughs> if that will happen, if that will happen. We are also not so good in the present history. We avoid the present history. But I can try. In my opinion, because Gabriel asked me to try, in my opinion, <laughs> minorities and poor people are going to suffer with the president with no experience in the executive. That in his 27 years and four mandates as a federal deputy, shown to be very, a very male chauvinist, sorry for this, against all kinds of minorities that fought for the military corporation and that insisted in dividing the country and betting in polarization. Let me end and start the conversation with a good passage coming from another book of Machado de Assis. I'm referring to Isaías Caminha and more particularly the case of the Confeitaria do Custódio, Custódio's Space Pastry. Mm -hmm. In 1888, November 88, no, sorry, November 1889, Custódio, that was the owner of a very traditional pastry, decided to paint another board, another sign to his confeitaria, his pastry. As he read in the newspaper that a new political regime was going to start, he decided to change the name of his place according to the new wave. And he decided to call Confeitaria da República, Republic's Pastry. Later on, he fought again, talked with Conselheiro Aires, and considered that the regime was too new and could not last longer. So he decided for another name. Confeitaria do governo. <laughs> government of the pastry. Because he thought every regime has a government, so I have no chance to, to make a mistake here. But he thought more once again and considered that every government has opposition. So that was certainly not a good title for his establishment, because he was very much afraid of opposition. Another idea. He decided to keep the original name, Confeitaria do Custódio, and just add a date, founded in 1856. He, was, he thought it was brilliant, but again, Custódio realized that the moods of the time were very unstable, and a person could not note or read the date. It could be very confusing, everything. After so many considerations, he finally concluded that the, that was best to say to stay with the original name, Confeitaria do Custódio. And Machado de Assis put an end of the story in a brilliant and sonorous way. He, he wrote, revolutions always carry some costs. <laughs> ending my, it's not a speech, but ending is my, okay, it's a nice speech, with a, with a no end, explains a lot about how Brazilians, or I guess I am, are facing this particular moment, waiting for the future, waiting for the goal. In my opinion, the good sign that was really great was the movement that civil society carried on between the first and the second round. That was very moving, very moving. Writing manifests, organizing Pacific demonstrations, sending articles to newspaper, acting like public intellectuals or public artists or public musicians, trying to campaign, or public citizens, trying to campaign using WhatsApp and, and sending all kinds of messages. Part of the, of the Brazilians realized that democracy is always a process, a process of fighting for rights. Some of us consider that rights you gain are rights you have, we had forever. But democracy is not like this. Democracy can be confused, noisy, ambiguous, very important, but in my opinion, it's worthwhile. Thank you so much.
Um, sorry for bringing you on the spot here to talk about the ifs and like. Just because. <laughs> it's just I, I, I thought about that because uh, there's for me at least a, a sense that I feel a disconnect in, in among Brazilians between uh, the present and the past. Uh, there seems to be this this difference between what is history and what is the present situation, and that was really um, something that struck me about your speech. Um, and I, it, it, made me, it made me think about this whole polarization process that we're going through now that has a lot to do with relying on like the figure of this great leader or, or, or like, sort of a father for the country that has been um, recurring. I mean, you have um, um, supporters of Don Pedro I around the, the, the time of his departure and then uh, Don Pedro II. Um, and then like, you have Getúlio Vargas, you have Lula, with a lot of people and now we have Bolsonaro. So do you feel like that is, um, do, do, what do you see, is that like a sort of a colonial um, legacy that we have until this day? How can we like transform that into something that is not bad for us? Okay. You know, that's I am honest. Can I sit here? Can you go better if I stay there? Better here. Okay. Okay. I ask him and he says, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a historian, but I'm also an anthropologist. And sometimes I'm very worried about the, the, the ways we use history. When I say it's a legacy, what's my more important concern? I'm worried, Gabriel, that we, are, we would, would say things like this. OK, that's the problem of the past. We have not, nothing to do in the present. So of course we have this colonial class, we have this big uh, landowners, <coughs> now we're in 16, 17, 18, 19, and still not the century. Of course we have this patrimonialism uh, as a form of government. But I, and I think that we Brazilians, we were not very well, every time I, I traveled to, to Latin America, I was very uh, angry with them because it was a moment that we Brazilians, we, we would not discuss polit politics. That was something that it was not with us. It was very strange. Also, you were, I wrote about it, that we have this kind of, of how can I explain, a kind of of behavior that we think that our leaders are, are, are like the fathers. That's why I wrote an article about this at Max. You know? It was like this with Pedro II. It was like this with Chateau Vargas. It was like this with Lula eventually. And it's like, exactly <coughs> like this with Bolsonaro. So you have a good father that can be very nice to the, the, the son that he really loves and very, very tough with the one that he does not like. So I think this is a way, but I think we are learning. Eventually, after 30 years, we, we are very stubborn, but we are learning, you know? Uh, I'm going to, to give you just one example that was very funny, that when I was finishing uh, a book I wrote about Pedro the Second, and that I use a lot of illustrations because this is the first time I'm not using illustration. I've thought a lot about this. But and then I, I remember I was in Salvador and then a man I went to a church and a man said a man that worked work, work in the church, he said to me, Oh, I want you, Professor, to go to the back of the church because we have a terrific <coughs> painting of Pedro the Second. So like, okay, let me go. Because it was always like this. People would love to show me a thing and <coughs> I was I always came up with a bad meal. Okay, that's not original. That's not so. I said, okay, I'm going there. The, the painting of Pedro the Second was not really good, but the situation was beautiful. It was like this. I saw Pedro the First was in the top. Uh, no, Pedro the First was in the bottom. In the middle, I saw the photography of Getúlio Vargas, and on the top. Antonio Carlos Magalhães. <laughs> so that was so meaningful for me. 
So this idea that we wait for the, uh, the uh, for example, I had some friends that used to say that the first time Lula uh, one that, uh, uh, was going, uh, was trying to be a president. He used a kind of, what do you say, a kind of propaganda. But it was something like this: "A um brasileiro como você, a Brazilian like you are." And some of the people said that's not very good because of the thing Brazilians want is to have a person different from them. So. Bolsonaro is using this kind of image. And it's, uh, it's really unbelievable to see the way people behave in front of him. As an anthropologist, uh, you know that anthropologists is different from historians. We love gossips and this kind of thing. But we also love to be part of the thing. So I am to the police that I mean, I swear, was not using a yellow and green t-shirt. <laughs> but it was just there, and it was, uh, almost unbelievable to see the behavior of this po that the population. The idea of he was almost a saint. He was almost the, the idea of having the great leader, you know, supreme leader, tells a lot about the about the president leader, not the president, but about the depiction of the president that some of the persons that vote Bolsonaro had in mind. Yeah. Um, I guess we're gonna just, just comment on, on that because um, when you go to also there were Bolsonaro in favor of Bolsonaro this manifestations and also some Lula free and pro Lula manifestations. When you also see the pro Lula manifestations, they also act like Lula is a saint, and so I think yeah. that's the sentiment that it's both sides. Yeah, both sides have this. Yeah, I think this extreme. Behavior of people. We complete this. What's your name? Rafael. 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 I could not agree. I, I did completely. That was a problem. That we faced because it was there. For example, I'm going to give my example. I wrote a manifestation. I had thirty thousand persons that, and we asked politicians. We were so many. It was in the beginning of the, the second round, and we we asked the, the, the politicians to act as politicians. But it was exactly like this, because, uh, and we were right, because uh, in my opinion, uh, Lula uh, had a terrible role, I'm sorry for that, I think you are, I, I'm sure, I, can, I can see that you are recording this. That's what you do. You use this with our uh, scholars in particular? Or not? <laughs> no problem, no problem, I, I am in that group, so I'm in that we saw that list that they call black list, and so I was interviewed about the black. This list I said, the list is not black, it's white. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, and what are your feelings? Are you afraid about this? And I said, oh no, I'm going to put in my lattice. <laughs> and I said, you don't have any opinion about it. I said, I do have. I prefer to be in this list. No? But why I said that? But we took a moment to But about, uh, no, I just swear. That, that, that was the recording, and then PT again. We tried hard to talk. And that was, uh, I, I gave classes with that. We tried hard to talk, and I was saying that Lula had a terrible role in this, because in my opinion, it took such a long time for him to, do, to say that Haddad was the person, that he allowed it, Haddad to be called as o poste. So he was part of it. And also, I have a lot of friends, good friends, that you were right, they treat Lula as a kind of saint, a, a kind of myth. So that's something that strikes me a lot. Because when you, as an anthropologist, when you talk about a myth, you cannot have a discussion with a myth. <laughs> you cannot disagree with a myth. Or you can, but you must go to. So I think we, when I use this expression of that Brazilians wait for the father, I was talking about PT and about PSL, about Bolsonaro and about Lula also. So I think my opinion is 100% right. And sorry, sorry, scholars in particular. <laughs> no, probably they are very proud of you. <laughs> so, so. Hi, thank you. My name is Daniela, PhD student history here at CUNY Graduate Center. Um, it's still like on the theme of linking past and present, which is quite a nice 
analogy thing. And making like a soul searching exercise because you point out that you really didn't see it coming. Uh, and from a historical perspective, how do you see it? Have we not historicized the far right or the political right enough? Would you, would you talk about that? Thank you. No, thank you. Another good question, I think that is good. Uh, as I said, I think my generation failed. I, I wrote that, and I'm saying that we really failed. I think that I can explain using history. So we had a dictatorship regime. Uh, we, uh, at the end of the dictatorship regime, we, we built a very modern, a very interesting constitution, too long. I don't think that you have any constitution that it's perfect. But then ours is very, uh, because I, re uh, I do not remember, but I remember reading that Ulysses Guimarães, uh, when he showed the constitution, he said, eu mostro essa constituição com raiva da ditadura. The anger. He, he, had, he, he mentioned anger. So after the, the, the military regime, we had 30 years of democracy. If you think about we have one impeachment that was uh, part of the game, again, no, the institutions were very strong. We had elections. Comparing to the United States, we are very fast. <laughs> we knew the name of the new president in one hour. In the United States, you were still dealing with the, with the Florida votes, no? And then, so it's a very good system, very ethical system. So I think that what is we historians, we try to understand is democracy in Brazil. And that was a moment, then, Daniela, no? that, that not just we Brazilians, but all around the world, many we thought that democracy was the end of the process. Eventually, Fukuyama wrote that that was the end of the history. No? It was not as us, no? and then we really thought that democracy was the ultimate, ultimate answer. So we started studying uh, new subjects. I think, in my opinion, Daniela, every generation carry on new questions. Then, I think my generation, we asked about questions that we wanted to know. We asked about <coughs> questions of civil rights. No? I just uh, wrote this book of Lima Barreto. What I said that you do not have a, diff a, 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 bio a biography that is the fan, the fan, the fan, the fan, the fan, yes, there is not such a thing. Because every time we go back to old subjects, we go back with new questions. So our questions were minorities. So for example, we, we build a very important historiography uh, around the slave system. Uh, talking about this kind of questions, racism in Brazil, racism in the past, but we also uh, created, as an anthropologist, I would say, a very good group of gender studies. We also did that with, with uh, social markers of difference that are gender, race, but also, but also class, generation, region, and uh, we eventually put together you know, the inter intersection of it. So uh, I cannot describe all the things we studied, but I think we, as I said, we believed in democracy and then we believed in the, in the things we faced and we, that we fought for. So I think it's your generation. <laughs> it's your test now, now to try, it's my test too, you know, because now it's the moment to go public in Brazil. I was talking about, I was not a, I never act like this. And now I have an Instagram, now I have a lot of people that I have no idea how to deal with. I have a, I, so I, I write articles not just in Exo, but for the Sao Paulo asked me to write against Bolsonaro when Bolsonaro talked about that. Remember when he said that the Portuguese did not put a fee in, in Africa? And then I, just wants to be like a, Yeah, uh, but no, the problems were the Africans. They wanted so very much to be in 
slaves. So. And then, so we have to go public now. That's one thing. And the other thing is we have to, that's what I wanted to say. We, now we have to study what happened. Because we have a lot of studies about the left wing, but we do not have a, we have some. I have some, I believe, some colleagues of mine that studied, I have one colleague of mine that studied the militants, Pierre Lerner. I have some colleagues of mine that studied the right wing. But I remember that when I was part of a, 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 a big research at the desk with Sergio Miceli, that we studied the history of social science in Brazil, a friend of mine, John, uh, he was studying the, 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 part, the Congress in Brazil. And he is American. And he said, it's very strange in Brazil, because everybody is left is all central left. You cannot find a right person. And now we are very welcome to this world. So I think that's. This is a new question, a new challenge that you are going to face. Yeah, I don't know your topic, but probably you are going to study this if you ask. Most probably you are going to be in it. Oh, thank you for this amazing talk. It's very, um, I think, current and I think inspiring to see some of your thoughts and to see the depth with which you presented them. So I'm very moved. And my question is, um, uh, about the role of religion uh, in this uh, in this movement, that you have uh, uh, emphasized that there is a myth that's being made out of the leader that is called sometimes supreme, and uh, and Brazil has a very interesting relationship with religion, right? Uh, very interesting. Yeah, to put it in a, in a way, uh, uh, coming from a, a secular constitution and supposedly a secular state, but having a very devout people. Very? Devout, devout. right? Very, very passionately, fervently religious people uh, in comparison to what we see in the United States. Well, you have all, all kinds of religions. Well, okay, let's talk about So I'm curious about where you see this role of spirituality, religion, and religiosity within this new movement that's coming for these next few years. That's very strong. Now, we, um, uh, as I said, we had like this the national. It was unbelievable. I don't know what you, what, or, uh, what you thought when you saw that kind of mix of ritual, religious ritual, that the president would start with this kind of. I, I thought, okay, come on. <laughs> and then uh, I think religion is very important. He uh, Bolsonaro. And we see the very important, uh, uh, if you think about TV Record, if you think about evangelical churches that gave money for this, his campaign, if you think of, now I'm going to create a, a church without parties. <laughs> Not a school without parties, but a church without parties. Because that was very, very easy to see, not, not not in the beginning, but now. And the, the thing I mentioned that we did not see. I'm not saying that he married Michelle. It's not like as I said, I don't suppose he loved gossip. It's not a gossip. I'm not saying that he did not like that it was on purpose. But what we know that my, my, Bolsonaro used it to describe himself as a Christian. So he had this religious speech. And then she, he married Michelle, that is evangelical, that works for the church. She has a she she has a special role in the church. And then as an anthropology, I really really think that rituals and symbols are very strong. I remember seeing Bolsonaro going to the Jordan River in Israel. I said I said, come on, what's happening here? Because it was, it was at the same time when Putin entered in the, remember the cold water? Both of them. And water has always a special meaning in myth because water is always running. And sometimes they say water is always into Pinawa uh, cosmo cosmology. They say that all water is always cleaning things. So I thought, what about having this kind of image? What, and Bolsonaro started saying that he would change the place of our embassy in Jerusalem long time ago. 
Remember he said, I'm going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. So I think religion is very important in our country. Before Bolsonaro, uh, we had a, a, a terrible fight, you know, in the, slum, in the slums of Rio de Janeiro between uh, the povo de Santo, uh, the kind of black people and evangelical people. So this is an internal fight, very strong. Catholic Church, it's losing space and trying to, to become bigger again. But even when during the empire, when we had the Paduan, <laughs> that the king was the chief of the state and the church, we knew that it was not very much true. Kenneth II eventually wrote a letter saying, I have this power, but I know I do not have this power. <laughs> so church is a very important player in Brazil. And Bolsonaro was very, very smart in the way he galvanized him could have this kind of church that would follow him to Jerusalem or to the Tel Aviv, the man, as he wanted. So I think we are going to see how church is a very important player. Do you have more questions? Yes. Can I ask a question? Okay. Sure. Yeah, it's called with our party. Um, <laughs> I'm Brazilian. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question regarding uh, Marielle Franco. I think this was a very important event yeah. that was very downplayed, even though it had international per uh, percussion outside. And uh, I'd like to your input on that. And also, um, how much would you blame PT for the uh, insurgence of uh, the, the right in Brazil? How much would you blame uh, PT? And how much would you uh, blame Lula? Because he holds up for so long uh, to tell uh, uh, Haddad, okay, you can go and you can uh, be uh, the candidate. How much would you, would you blame uh, PT and uh, Lula for that? If I, if I could add to this, if you could maybe put that in a little bit longer historical perspective, considering uh, all the years that PT was in party, and uh, I guess. You might be able to analyze them, but that instead of promoting this kind of um, well, conscience course. that would take the, the electorate away from this idea that we have a big product that's going to solve everything, and now it's in our hands and we have to go and do things and fight for our things, um, if that's, you know, in the long run, was not part of the problem. I don't know your name and your name. You have to um, kill yourself when you ask me. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> So we live in this kind of country that 
you have a lot of Marielis, and Marielle was a kind of expression of this new Brazil. So let's just start talking about PT, because PT is not just Lula's. Otherwise, we are going to repeat the idea that we are going to personalize the problems. I think it's not the moment to personalize problems. It's the moment to think about that in a collective way. Otherwise, it's very easy to blame one person. No, it's not my position. I think that we had a particular problem that I mentioned, but I think that it's something bigger than than Lula. In the case of Marielle, I think Marielle was a result of the quota system that some of us fought a lot to have it. The University of Sao of Sao Paulo was the last one, <laughs> but even so, we were stubborn. You know, at the, at, until the, I remember being, uh, that we were there, and the lady they said, "Yes," I said, oh, "I'm not hearing well, well," because we tried so, so many times, no. But the, what? Marielle was an expression of this new Brazil. New Brazil created by this uh, era of PSDB and this era of P PT era. No? When we created a lot of new universities, when we allowed people to study in public universities, poor people, middle class people, when we had uh, a new media class a new social media class in Brazil, when we open a lot of consume habits and customs for more people, when we allow the Brazilians to read and write, when so Marielle is a result of this Brazil. Marielle is also a result of the policies that was, a, a, I think we live in a, uh, in a country that is profoundly unequal, and we had this vestibular, this is a common exam that we call universal. That cannot be universal if the country is not universal. You know? So uh, sometimes you have to desigualar para igualar. Sometimes you have to do it. And I, I defend court system, not just because of our past because of our present and also because of a very positive thing. Because I think as an anthropologist that more is more. If you would have different people in the university, we would be more, we would be stronger, we would be more open to democracy. So this is a good sign of democracy. Marielle was also a symbol of this this positive of affirmative action. When we started to teach in the schools that in the past we were European, we were Amerindians, we were North American, South American, but we, are, we were also Africans. When we started to talk about not just one mythical Africa, but various Africans, the Africa of the, the Western, the Eastern Africa, the Eastern coast that was so important, talking about Nigeria and our men. The Central Africa, I'm talking about the port of Rwanda. Or the Western Africa, I'm talking about the second slave system in the 19th century, that's the African that came from Mozambique. So we are talking, we have to talk about the North Brazil. And we have to include African history in our curriculum. So my reality was, a symbol of this Brazil. And when they killed, they killed Marielle, they killed all of us that believed in this kind of democracy, that believed in the, uh, like 30 years of democracy. So Marielle is not just Marielle. It's very much Marielle. But it's not just Marielle. It's bigger, bigger than her, being her. And Lula, I started answering, you no? Know? It's not an answer, but I think that's uh, PG failed in a lot of things. No, we, uh, it failed in keeping institutions stronger, failed in dealing with the financial crisis and recession. Uh, Lula, Lula and Fernando Henrique Cardoso, both of them failed in not creating the future. If you think about PSDP, and you think about PT, Lula and Fernando Henrique, they 
they, they couldn't create the social values they hired, no? Are you going to say that our the governor of Sao Paulo, that it's so difficult to say his name, the future governor of Sao Paulo, that he is the future of that PSDB? He's not. Or even a dad, it was as we it's like too late. And that is probably one of the best he's a good, very good politician. I think he was politician, I think he was a very good minister of education. Very good. He failed in some things in A. Remember that the comments we had with the in the beginning. Also he was a very I think he was a good mayor to some power. He had problems, he faced problems, but he had a problem, he had a project. So he's a good one, but I do not think that Lula gave, built him as a candidate. And I think that every time you have this kind of problem, you fail, you know? Because you have to work and you have to think in the future. And that, in my opinion, this is one of the things. And again, I don't think we have to blame actually Lula. Because we are going to create another body spiritual. It's not my fault. You know? I think it's my fault. I think it's our fault. All of us here. No, it's not just Lula's fault. It's his fault also. But it's more fault. It is uh, Silvio Gomes' fault. It is Marina's fault. No, I think all of us, no? Um, you said something uh, very interesting. You, you said about money that when we killed her, they killed us as well. We have to, like, to do the work. I, I, I think that, I mean, in my opinion, they attempted to kill us, but now there has been, uh, I, I think it made people more aware, like, the people are more aware now of, of the fact that inequality exists and persists and, and that the institutions are not always fighting for them or like many of the times are not. So I think it's more like the attempt to take those, but not, not just yet. I don't think that assessment that if you have to kill someone, it's a good sign. You do not have to sure. kill a person to be a man, to not be a party. You were right, Gabriel, that's, that's Made, made some of us more, can I say, different, more yeah. attentive, more concerned. But I think that it was not necessary. And so that's why I said that they killed us. In a way, they killed us because they killed the kind of dream. You know? In my opinion, all of this is part of the process that ended in November 2018. I think that, that an election is a process. And even when you have, you have the end of an election, it's not the end of the process, you know, as we are facing now. And I think it started much, much, much before. And I now I think you saw some of the Bolsonaro's politicians uh, breaking the yeah, so it's a very strong symbol. No? They, were, they are saying the thing they did, we are not going to respect you. We are not going to respect this agenda. This agenda is not ours. It's very, it's a very open act, right? It's mm -hmm. not concealed anymore. Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was so violent. No? But was there ever respect? No. I mean, if, you're, if you're talking about a discourse that's absolutely racist, since forever, since colonial times. So it's just a repositioning of like a, this mentality, the Virginia mentality. But I think there is a difference. As an anthropologist, yeah. the, <coughs> the difference is there was a moment that it was not legitimate. We always had very racist speeches, very racist practices. We always had a structural racism. But there was a moment that it was not allowed to talk openly about it. I don't want to be naive. It was not allowed, but it was a way of, I'm not allowed to say, but I will continue thinking about it. But the thing that astonished me now is that they are allowed it. They are empowered.
talk about this openly, they are allowed to break a sign in front of all of, of, of us. That's why I think that uh, it's not the same thing. It's not the same. I'm talking about political speech, and I'm, I'm talking about our leaders. I think we have to think about it, you know, that it's a known context, and it's very dangerous. So, so what is the, the new role for this new, not new, I mean, for us, intellectuals, the left, the artists, the, like what is, other than opposition, which is something that has been happening since the first round, um, and I agree with you, beautiful movement, I feel about it, but that's not mine, but it's how it is. Yeah, but, uh, like, like what next? You know, because the failure of establishing uh, uh, opposition to Trump here in America is evident. <coughs> it's it is still there, it's still doing whatever. So how can we learn from these mistakes of this um, Trump uh, governance and translate it into power? reality in Brazil, given the differences also in racism. Okay. What's going on? Um, if I had the answer, I would not be here. <laughs> <laughs> I swear you are. <laughs> I'm not here to give you answers. No? I can talk about my experience in the sense. No? I think this social, this civil movement that we could see being uh, the first and the second round, it's still alive. So I'm part of a group. It's not a lot that we are, for example, creating a lot of lumbi lumbis, you know, public announcements. We are part of our constitutions. We are creating videos. We are learning <coughs> with Ronaldo Lemos and others how to use the WhatsApp, how to engage the WhatsApp. We are learning to, to how to create Easy messages, not the messages that we are used to it. How can we talk with people? How, uh, so we are learning how to be citizens and how to fight for democracy. Uh, it's brand new and eventually did not start. It's starting. And then we, that is a collective, a collective question. It's not an individual one. And I think that you have a society that is a democracy. If every one of us feel that we have something to do, uh, when you vote, it's not a question. You don't do not vote, and then you you are going to, to can I say delegate your vote? Or not? You have to fight for the person that you vote. You have to follow the person. I'm going to follow. You have to demand rights. And as I said, I think that's, I think that's new for Brazil. No why. But I think we have to. And that's a good opportunity. Perhaps now that we, that we have, I think that left and right are two polar concepts. You do not have a left wing if you do not have a right wing. The same thing with the establishment party. You do not have without if you do not have with. <laughs> so we are learning with this. The fact that we have a, a very strong, that we have very strong uh, right-wing politicians, it's a new challenge. You know? And I think that what we are learning, we are learning with Trump. And we did not learn enough. Because I know that Bolsonaro is the same as Trump. They say that very ridiculous things. For example, I had uh, four, three sons, and then I had a daughter and a faith. So the left, the person from the left, we are always, oh, this is ridiculous, this is that. And then when we open our eyes, they are passing the uh, schools without parties. It's unbelievable. So he, I think that they really say the things that we are, like, it's a scandal. How can we deal with this? And then the more important things, they are not they are not telling us. So I think we have to be more smart. We have to be not to be like them, no, no. but we have 
it's just that I think like um, sorry, we we gotta understand somehow what's the appeal, what they are listening. Because what I feel is like I don't I don't know how to talk, you know, to 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 the, those who voted for for him. It was very that was here, but was you have friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was very difficult. And uh, I still don't think I grasp really what what is that made them some some okay you know the military or the or the military police okay that's fine that's easy but well they're not the majority what was the appeal? You know, if I may add, like not just also like the appeal for them, but also what can make people at times disregard negative things about the candidate because at least for me a lot of my uh, 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 people who talked to me who were going to vote for him was the, the, their reasoning was um, okay there are all these things that are wrong and they're very bad things but um, there's also this one thing that he does that I like so it's like how do you and he thinks better than yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, how do you yeah. Yeah. Well, you had different, as Monica said, you had different kinds of people that vote for Bolsonaro. Uh, you had the ones that vote because of the crisis, the obsession. You know that when you have a big crisis, there was a political, moral, control, economical crisis that you were facing. We know in the history and that we, you, you can have a very authoritarian leadership. So that's one thing. Second thing, corruption. Car wash to that was it was very corrupt. It was not just PT. That was big news. <laughs> not big news. As I said, it was not. As I said, corruption yeah. is part of But the thing is, car wash showed this in the media and showed it like a big, big, big performance. You know? Let's see what Boy was going to show us now. It was a good yeah, because he said he was the first one to say I'm not going to go to politics and then that was 2016. So it's not so long ago. Huh? Oh, let's talk about corruption. It's not brand new. But what is new? That you have co corruptores, corruptus in the jail. Both of them. That's new. Corruptores. And not just and that's that's new. Again, as I said to Anna, we have to to face this. We have new things. And also we have this very, very, very strong anti PT sentiment. That's I don't know if you, some of you were in Brazil. That was astonished. Astonished. I talked to a lot of people in Morica and that was the most difficult subject. But not that I didn't want to do, talk about it, but people, they're okay, you are right, Haddad is a much better politician, is a much better person. I know that the Bolsonaro is not, it's not new. I know that, oh my I know that Bolsonaro, Haddad, uh, oh, you're right, but that, 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 that everything is better than to have Pichy again. I cannot stand having Pichy again. It was like a very uh, emotional, visceral thing. Hmm? Visceral. Totalmente visceral. Very emotional. I think that's a consequence and then, and then of the kind you, of messages that people were getting all the time. Yeah, and then when you have a very emotional one, you, you cannot uh, discuss using very rational. How one. much do you attach? I think we have other. Yeah, I'm going to do one last question. Before yeah, that. but then I'm, what appeal, I think? Uh, corruption? Bolsonaro uh, uh, using the messiahs as a person that is going to to come and bring again to, to stability. And our problem was not the corruption of the state, it was the corruption of the city. That's Bolsonaro. And I'm going to put an end in the practice. So look at the promises. So we have the ingredients. Um, can we get one from the back? Hey, hi. Uh, my name is Rogerio. Hi. Hi. My name is Rogerio. What's your name again? Rogerio. 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 Um, <laughs> you say Brazilian names, you know, in the American accent, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say 
that in Portuguese anymore. <laughs> That's okay, it's fine. Uh, how do you evaluate the performance of Partido Novo? Partido Novo. And uh, is it too soon to evaluate the importance of Partido Novo for a uh, historical point of view? Do I have to have some questions or do I have to have some questions? Okay, so Partido Novo. Otherwise, I have to discuss it. Partido Novo is brand new. Right. So Partido Novo was one of the, it's not the winner, because I think the winner is PSN. But Partido Novo made a governor in Belarus. In Minas. In Minas, huh? Not the, of course. That's not, if it's a governor, it's not Belarus. Oh, <laughs> sorry for this. That is the way he's studying. My partner, that he's, he's always, all the time, talking about Belarus. But uh, Minas Gerais is a very important state. About the, I'm talking about the, our agenda. But Partido Novo also showed to be a kind of eye of, I don't know, I think we have to wait to see. I think we have to wait, it's too soon. And I think the, we had the answers of Partido Novo, but they did, also they didn't want to join this very big front. They went for Bolsonaro then. That was very sad to have an actual group that votes for Bolsonaro, that defends democracy and votes for Bolsonaro. In my opinion, it was a big contradiction. My but that, I can be emotional. And I think we have to end. I live in a neighborhood where we have a lot of people from Partido Novo, and it was very nice. To see how they were celebrating, uh, and at the same time, it scares me because again, you have a, a, a party that thinks just about the party, not about the country. I'm very worried because it's a new one, and it looks like a, an old one. But that's just my opinion. A humble opinion. Um, so since it's 6.30, we're going to uh, continue over a reception that we have downstairs. I want to thank you. Oh, we can do that. Oh, we can do that. I'm very busy. I'm very so, so people can, have, can ask you questions personally. And thank you so much. But I couldn't answer all of the questions.